Susan Herring is a professor of information sciences and linguistics and director of the Center for Computer Mediated Communication at Indiana University Bloomington. She's a pioneer in language focused study of computer mediated communication, and her work has explored a wide range of subjects, including structural, pragmatic, interactional, and social phenomena in digital communication, um, as well as a particular focus on gender and computer, computer mediated communication, which is what she'll be talking about in part today. Um, she also has recent interests that include online multilingualism, multimodal computer mediated communication, and telepresence robot mediated communication. She's a former editor of the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication, and she's currently an editor of the online journal Language at Internet. She's published a wide, wide range of articles on all of these subjects, um, too many to list, but I am going to list um, a few of her co-edited volumes that are pertinent to our discussion today. CMC Computer Mediated Communication, Linguistic, Social, and Cross-Cultural Perspectives from 1996. The Multilingual Internet, Language, Culture, and Communication Online, which is from 2007 and was co-authored um, with Danit and the Handbook of Pragmatics and Computer Mediated Communication, which is from 2013 and was co-authored with Stein and Vitranen. A thread through her work has focused on genre and uh, gender and digital communications, um, and that's what she's going to be talking about with us today. And her talk title is Ideology, Power, and Social Differences in Computer Mediated Communication, a Gender Retrospective. Please join me in welcoming Susan Herring. So, uh, although I do not primarily study uh, second language, I am a, a, a learner of second languages myself. I've studied 12 different languages. Uh, part of my background is a linguist. I've lived abroad um, and uh, uh, have a, a great deal of interest in language learning, but it's more of a personal interest than a professional one. But uh, from the perspective of computer media and communication, um, I just want to point out right up front that uh, CMC has a number of advantages for naturalistic language learning, that is for language learning uh, outside the classroom or outside pedagogical online context. And the reasons for that are, first of all, that there's an abundance and a variety of online environments that one could choose from according to their interests. One can also participate relatively anonymously. It's possible not to be seen. It's possible not to have one's voice heard which masks uh, accent. Um, and uh, because most CMC traditionally has been typed, uh, typing gives one more time to compose one's thoughts than speaking does. And of course, transcripts can be saved for later studies. So I think these are, uh, these are advantages. However, women and men have different experiences in online spaces. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the research that I've been doing over the, the past 28 years concerning gender and communication in online spaces. Before I do so, uh, there's a couple of caveats. One is that I'm going to be talking about English language spaces uh, that are uh, platforms that are based primarily in the United States. The second caveat is that when I talk about gender, I'm going to be talking about males and females uh, in these studies, uh, persons of unknown gender uh, are, are, it's not what I'm going to be presenting those results today because, of course, we don't really know. Um, and as far as I know, uh, the, the studies did not take into consideration the, uh, the sexual orientation of the participants, although because the majority of platforms where the studies were conducted are default heteronormative environments, uh, then uh, I, I think it's safe to assume that the majority of participants uh, are, are probably heterosexual. Um, and then a third caveat is that I'm going to be talking about adults. So let's go back in time, decades and decades, back to the 1960s and 1970s. And uh, the first thing to point out is that the internet was created by geeky, uh, men, mostly young men, who held libertarian values. They believed that the internet should be free from any kind of centralized control and free from any kind of censorship whatsoever. Speech online should be absolutely free. It was also the case that um, up until 19, well, really up until 2000, 
The overwhelming majority of participants in CMC on the internet were male. Um, in 1995, for instance, uh, I mean, sorry, 1990, um, which was about when I started my research, uh, about 95% of participants were, were male. Despite this, there were a number of early claims that were made about the democratizing potential of CMC, including specifically for women. Uh, so uh, the claims were, for example, that because CMC is inherently democratic, it levels traditional distinctions of social status and creates opportunities for less powerful individuals than groups to participate on a par with members of more powerful groups. And women, in particular, as the socially, politically, and economically less powerful gender, would be especially likely to benefit from this. And underlying these claims was an assumption uh, that had to do with uh, anonymity the anonymity of online communication, which I think is reflected very well in a famous cartoon that was published in The New Yorker in 1993. It shows a dog sitting at a computer terminal talking to his or her doggy friend on the floor and saying, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. The dog here is a metaphor for members of stigmatized groups, whether they be people of color, people with disabilities, uh, poor people, or I would argue also uh, women. And so these claims inspired me to conduct empirical research into the nature of communication online by, uh, by men and women. And what I found was that gender is not, not invisible, even in these uh, so-called anonymous environments. Um, for one thing, I found differences in participation. Uh, so, for example, males in public electronic mailing lists in the 1990s uh, post more messages, they post longer messages, male messages receive more responses, and males are more likely to persist in posting even when they receive no response. Whereas females only post more under two circumstances, one, when the group has a female moderator, and two, when more than 60% of the group uh, is made up of, um, of females. Despite this, females uh, are perceived as dominating when they post more than 30% of the messages. I also found differences in discourse styles. Uh, messages from males were more likely to be impersonal, uh, fact-oriented, to make strong assertions, use profanity, insults and sarcasm um, and rhetorical questions, uh, especially contentious rhetorical questions, to challenge others and to disagree with others boldly. Whereas female messages were more likely to be emotional and relation oriented, to make mitigated assertions rather than strong assertions, to use non-declarative speech acts, such as questions, offers, and suggestions, polite expressions, such as thanks and apologies, and to support and agree with others. This is an example of uh, uh, an extreme version of the male style that I identified uh, from a group called Politics L, somewhere in the middle 90s. Um, in this message, the respondent, uh, the participant is responding to an earlier message, which is indicated by angle brackets at the beginning of the line. And the previous poster they're talking about gun control. The previous poster said, yes, they did. This is why we must be allowed to remain armed. Who is going to help us if our government becomes a tyranny? No one will. And the participant in this case responds, oh yes, we must remain armed. Anyone see day one last night about Charlestown where everyone's so scared of informing on murderers the cops have given up? Where the reply to any offense is a public killing? Knowing you're not going to be caught because everyone's afraid to be a witness? Yeah, right, twerp. And then the previous person signed themselves Ron the Wise, and this participant says, what a joke. And so I think that um, re people reading this message at that time would have had no difficulty in identifying this poster as male, in fact, both of them as male. Uh, some of the stylistic features that characterize this masculine style 
include um, insults, sarcasm, contentious rhetorical questions, and uh, direct challenges. In contrast, we can look at an example of an extreme version of a message that uh, illustrates a female style of communication. This is from a, uh, an electronic discussion list called women.l. And uh, again, we've got a situation where a participant is responding to another participant. The first participant addresses uh, someone called Aileen and says, I just wanted to let you know that I've really enjoyed all your posts about women's history. They've been extremely informative, and I've learned a lot about the women's movement. Thank you, Erica. And uh, this current participant says, ditto, with four exclamation points. They are wonderful. Did anyone else catch the first part of a century of women? I really enjoyed it. Of course, I didn't agree with everything they said, but it was really informative for Berta. The characteristics of female style here include emotional expression, use of repeated punctuation marks, for example, uh, a supportive tone, um, and uh, uh, thanks, and as well as um, expressing a view and then qualifying it or justifying it. And this is something that I also observed that uh, women did more in their messages. So again, I think that uh, people reading this at the time in that group would have had no difficulty at all identifying the authors of these messages as, uh, as female. I studied some 25 or so uh, electronic discussion groups, and I ended up uh, classifying their, the, the gendered styles into um, um, categories that can, that can be represented in terms of overlapping bell curves. Uh, and so towards the left uh, bell curve, which is one more characteristic of uh, male posters, uh, the style I characterized as uh, adversarial or perhaps anarchic and agonistic. And so messages towards the extreme left uh, would be easily identifiable, uh, I think, by most people as, um, as male. On the right side, uh, the female bell curve, towards the right extreme, we have the use of positive politeness, um, and also to a certain extent negative politeness, the desire to not um, um, impinge on others or to uh, uh, restrict others' freedom of, of action. Um, and I characterize this style as attenuated uh, on the one hand and supportive on the other. And again, towards the very far right, uh, most people would have no difficulty identifying these authors as, uh, as female. Of course, in the middle, there is a, also a broad area of overlap where the uh, gender style of the poster is not as readily transparent. Now, around the same time, uh, chat environments were also very popular, um, especially internet relay chat, but also mugs and moves, and later on, um, well, and also um, uh, AOL chat, for example, back in the 90s, and then later on web chat online. And the, um, what was interesting about these chat environments from the point of view of gender uh, was that they were claimed to foster play with identity, um, in part, especially because people tended to participate in chat using pseudonyms. And uh, so it was argued, for example, by Brendan Dan in uh, the late 90s, that pseudonyms function as masks that invite experimentation with gender identities in playful, carnivalesque ways, effectively deconstructing traditional gender binaries. Um, so I studied uh, online chat, and uh, as well as a number of other people have also studied online chat. And what we found was that actually uh, there were gender differences um, in participation and also in discourse styles again. In terms of participation, uh, there were far more males than females participating in public chat rooms. Um, however, when females participated, they received more responses uh, and responses were mostly of a, of a sexual nature. Uh, in terms of discourse styles, the male chat messages use more profanity and sexual references, uh, actually three times as many in a study that I conducted as, as women did. They use more evaluative judgments, more sarcasm insults, and they perform virtual violent actions such as killing uh, each other, um, whereas 
Females uh, use more emoticons and laughter, representations of laughter, three times as many of those as the males did in my study. Uh, they attributed feelings to themselves and to others, they expressed support, and they performed affectionate virtual actions, such as hugs towards others. Now, these differences in behavior, uh, as well as the fact that gender is not invisible online, have social consequences. Uh, these include the fact that in serious mixed sex contexts, such as academic discussion groups, women participate and are responded to less than men. They have less of a voice and less influence in these environments. Uh, women also are sexualized in ostensibly neutral domains, such as recreational chat. And women are more often the targets of harassment in all CMC contexts. Uh, in response to this, women have created women-only forums in search of safe spaces to make their voices heard so they can talk about what they want to talk about without fear of being disrupted or harassed. And to give you an idea of the extent to which that kind of uh, disruption uh, took place, in a 2006 study reported that female named chat users get 25 times more malicious messages. Uh, so what they did is they went into a bunch of internet relay chat rooms and just simply adopted a username that either reflected a female gender or a male gender, or in some cases a neutral gender. And they found that chat room participants with female usernames received 25 times more threatening and or sexually explicit private messages than those with male or ambiguous usernames. Female usernames on average receive 163 malicious private messages a day. And this is why when I was studying internet relay chat, I always used a gender neutral username. Um, so, but technology continued to evolve and an important evolution, uh, uh, important evolutionary um, a milestone was the introduction of weblogs. I, I give the date as being approximately around 2000 when people started really noticing weblogs. And weblogs truly were a democratizing technology in the sense that anyone with internet access could create and publish a blog for free. Uh, and this was remarkable because publishing had traditionally been restricted to the domain of, um, um, well, educated, uh, educated adults. Um, um, who, who speak certain languages, who have certain access um, through their education um, to get past the gatekeepers that, that control the publication process. Whereas now we were seeing that, that even any teenager could, could publish their views and potentially be read by uh, tens of thousands of people on the internet. Uh, so this was unprecedented. Uh, another characteristic of blogs is that blogs, blog owners can craft the language of their en entries very, very carefully, and moreover, they can edit it later. They can improve their, their language uh, later on in response to further reflection or, or feedback from others. Uh, finally, bloggers can delete comments or choose not to allow comments at all, which gives them more control over the um, environment of their blog. Gender differences in blogging um, mainly have to do with what the uh, blogger wants to blog about. It has to do with the topic of the blog. Um, we found that women maintain more personal journal style blogs that focus on events in and reflection about uh, the blogger's personal life. And these uh, entries and these personal or diary style blogs use uh, what have been identified elsewhere as female stylistic features which is personal pronouns, especially the first person pronouns. Um, whereas men maintain more filter style blogs that focus on events and constructs external to the blogger, um, such as politics and religion. And these filter entries use what have been identified elsewhere as more characteristically male stylistic features, such as the use of noun determiners, demonstrative pronouns, and numbers. And so it's really uh, not the case that it's about, um, uh, or, or actually, it's, I think it's, uh, it provides a new insight into the nature of male and female stylistic differences because what we found here really is that even when males 
uh, write diary style blogs. They use more female style, so quote unquote, female stylistic features. And even when females uh, produce filter style blogs, they use more quote unquote, male style stylistic features. So it's really, what we're seeing here is that men and women are really talking about different things online. Uh, these differences have, again, social con uh, consequences. Uh, traditionally, men's writing has been valued more than that of uh, women. And uh, similarly, we see that women's personal diary blogging attracts less and less favorable attention than does men's uh, more quote unquote factual blogging. However, because bloggers have more control over their environment in terms of who comments, and perhaps also because of the traditional association between uh, uh, personal journals, diaries, and, um, and diary keeping, which is something that's a, a genre that's associated with women throughout history, the number of female bloggers, uh, when we did our study in 2004, equaled that of male bloggers. And among younger bloggers, females predominated. And so this was the distribution of the bloggers that we found looking at our random selection of bloggers online in 2004. And you can see that uh, uh, teenage girls actually were the uh, predominant bloggers. Uh, but among men, um, uh, they were adult blogging, I mean, we filter blogs. I also looked for more recent numbers, and I found um, a report from 2010, which again showed that female bloggers made up about 50.9%, which I think is very consistent with our findings here. Uh, of course, now we are in the era of uh, social media and so-called Web 2.0, which has been traced back to around 2004. And, uh, and, and two points that I think are two trends are, I think are particularly important to comment on here. Uh, one is that social network sites have replaced uh, blogs and other previous uh, uh, technologies in popularity. Um, and also there's this increasing trend towards multimodality. And as far as gender is concerned, one consequence of that is what Zhao Brass, Monk and Martin uh, in 2008 uh, dubbed anonymity. Uh, so no longer do we have the presumption of anonymity because people on social network sites are, for example, putting up their profile pictures of themselves and posting a number of other pictures of themselves and using their real names and talking about um, their real lives. And so no longer do we have this presumption of anonymity. How then does that affect gender communication? Uh, one difference that we find is that, that now that there are so many different kinds of platforms available online for CMC, men and women are self-sorting into different um, social media platforms. Uh, males prefer Reddit, YouTube, LinkedIn, and various gaming platforms, whereas females uh, prefer Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, Snapchat, Tumblr, and Messenger. And some, these environments, some of them are private, and others of them uh, give users more control over their interaction with other users. Um, Facebook, for example, has been described using the metaphor of a walled garden. It, it's your garden, and you uh, uh, do your thing there, and you invite your friends in, and they can observe you and comment on what you do. And I think, uh, in a large part, because of the popularity of Facebook and similar uh, social media platforms that follow this model, uh, we have seen an increase in the, in the participation of, uh, of young women, in particular, online, to the point where, as of 2016, the gap in participation that had existed up until that time uh, it was, is now closed. If you could compare here, if you can see the colored arrows on the left in 2006, there was still a gap in participation. Uh, but by 2016, that, that gap is gone. There's also information in this a slide about, about race and the socioeconomic class, but just focusing on gender, um, just notice that, that there is uh, now so much participation by both young people of both genders. And so um, in addition to these new kinds of social media platforms, like social network sites, uh, traditional platforms, CNC platforms also still continue to be used. Um, um, I did a study with Simon Kipijic, in 2011, looking at T 
to the SHAP platforms, we were interested to see if in 2011, 20 years after the first studies that I had done of gender differences online, uh, if communication patterns were, were different, especially among young people. And we found that there were um, a far more similarities than differences compared to 20 years ago. And these are the results here just for one of our measures, which looked at the tone of the chat messages. And we found that um, males used significantly more uh, flirtatious tones and aggressive tones, also somewhat more sexual folk tones, uh, whereas females use significantly more friendly tones. Uh, also, we looked at speech acts. We found that males used more manipulative, directed acts. Females used more responsive acts. And so, uh, in terms of social consequences, this shows that gender stereotypes are still being reproduced in teen chat. Males are more assertive, more sexually aggressive. Females still more friendly and accommodating. Um, um, so it turns out, perhaps unsurprisingly, that male preferred uh, social media environments are more contentious than those preferred by females, uh, particularly Wikipedia talk pages and Reddit have been ones that have been described in the literature as being uh, particularly uh, hostile to uh, women. And uh, finally, misogynistic harassment persists online and it even takes on uh, new and more severe forms such as revenge porn and rape and death threats, which are uh, increasingly common towards women. Um, the Pew Research Center conducted a study. This was uh, back in 2004. I think they would find the patterns even perhaps even more extreme now, looking at the experiences of online harassment of young men and young women compared to all internet users. And it shows that uh, young women are, are much more likely to be stalked online, to be uh, sexually harassed online, and to undergo experience of sustained harassment. So given all of this, as a result of my studies, I, I come to the conclusion that this idea that anonymity promotes gender equality is problematic in a number of ways. First, on the one hand, anonymity actually reduces social accountability, making it easier for harassers to engage in hostile, aggressive acts uh, with your consequences. But then, on the other hand, uh, most participants almost right from the very beginning actually use their real names in asynchronous EMC, and, and those names often indicated the bearer's gender, and this is even more true now. Uh, moreover, communicators give off cues as to their gender through their interactional style and their message content. So even if they don't use their real name, it's still often possible to identify their gender. And so what we and then moreover, nowadays we see that despite recent trends towards anonymity through the presentation of real identities and photos and personal information and so forth in multimodal CMC platforms, harassment still takes place. So, so basically, whether it's uh, on an anonymous, more anonymous platform, or a not, or an anonymous, I'm sorry, I can't say that, or an anonymous platform, uh, we're still seeing uh, a lot of, in fact, an increasing amount of harassment, which suggests that maybe anonymity does have some effect uh, uh, in a positive direction. It's hard to say. I think the reason, or I think a big part of the reason for this continued harassment is that the libertarian ideology of the internet's creators still persists. We see uh, very often that free speech, the notion of free speech is invoked to justify misogyny, hate speech, harassment, and silencing others by calling them censors. This is an ideology that inherently favors the strong and the most aggressive participants. It favors bullies, and it puts women and other groups at a disadvantage. But social media platforms have been slow to implement protections for users. And one of the reasons for that is that whenever they attempt to do so, there are protests that uh, it's censorship and that it's going to lead down a slippery slope towards uh, people's 
freedoms being taken away. Um, so returning to the early claims, uh, does the internet foster gender equality? Uh, I think we have to acknowledge, of course, that the internet provides opportunities for communication, collaboration, creative expression, and learning for both women and men, and that the number of women online has increased to catch up with offline demographics in the United States, and women now actually lead in social media use, which is a very important part of uh, communication online these days. But that the technological properties of CMC systems are clearly not sufficient to erase gender disparities, which have their roots in larger society and um, and may even exacerbate them. And I think that uh, uh, anonymity uh, in some cases can exacerbate gender disparities, but I think in particular, the ideology of a libertarian ideology of absolute free speech, uh, which has become institutionalized and part of the communicative structure of, of uh, the internet uh, is definitely has contributed over time to exacerbating gender disparities as well as disparities of other types and making the internet a more um, hostile place, at least in, in certain environments. So what can female second language learners do who wish to improve their, uh, their language use by going online in naturalistic computer media environments? Um, I would advise them, first of all, to identify online environments that give users control over who sees and responds to their posts and their personal information. Do a little research. Uh, and then perhaps identify friendly environments that relate in particular to their topics of interest because that would increase their motivation to read and to participate themselves. If in participating they, they receive inappropriate or threatening comments, they should disengage from the interaction immediately and not respond to provocation or to any uh, suspect forms of initiation. Uh, and of course, report harassment and other inappropriate behaviors to the platform administrators. It's helpful to save screenshots of, of the inappropriate uh, interactions. Um, because platforms are now starting to take measures to try to decrease uh, the incident of harassment um, and hate speech and misinformation and other kinds of antisocial behaviors online. And so we should take advantage of that and uh, report those behaviors. In short, um, I recommend And so with that, I conclude, and I'd be happy to discuss further any of the uh, any of the points that I that I mentioned if I.